asked to be with you today, I was really, um, I welcomed it. Um, I always um, want to be involved in these discussions which will continue to take us forward in this important part of women's health. And I was asked to talk about the history of abortion service provision in Victoria and I thought, where do I start? It is such a long, long story. And it's one of those heavily stigmatised but really important public health issues that has sat in the shadows breeding silence and shame. And yet it is one of the most common medical procedures sought by women with over 20% of Australian women aged between 16 and 59 years having had an abortion. Work to ensure that all women are able to obtain accurate information about abortion, make their own decision about abortion free from coercion or pressure, have access to safe, legal and affordable termination of pregnancy, and a service which is provided by a qualified health professional has been a really long and tortuous path. Some of the providers in this area talk about it as, as domestic terrorism. And that's a really new term. It's not something which has been used many years ago and I'm dragging it out into the open again. It's a very recent term. It's taken courageous advocacy over a long period of, t period of time by many women and men. And that's why I chose the topic, women's reproductive rights must always be a women's health advocacy priority. With many women in my large New South so Wales based family, I've had personal experience supporting many of them time. through their own so sexual our, and reproductive our, health our experience. This has included failure of contraception, decisions about when and if to bear a child when they're pregnant. I've worked with homeless women in Sydney have run the gauntlet of picketers while accompanying my clients to abortion services. I've driven a cab in Sydney, picked up women from Mascot, Mascot Airport and then taken them to the Sydney abortion services and have come to learn their story coming in from Queensland to have an abortion. I'm a nurse. I've been in many positions where I've witnessed and then intervened when a patient's right to inform decision making is being trampled by a health professional seeking to impose their own moral judgment on the patient. I've also been involved in very successful health promotion work such as the early days of anti-tobacco smoking and my very clever bugger up billboard graffiti which I've still got photographs of. And also through my work with the National Australian Nursing Federation confronting health sector discriminatory practice through development and adoption of universal precautions in the National HIV AIDS strategy. Both of these successful public health campaigns involve action across all health promotion dimensions. And these dimensions include legislation, policy, funding, education, research, workforce capacity, advocacy, openness and accountability, informed and active consumers, with continuous quality improvement and continual vigilance to keep moving forward. I brought all of this history into my role when I was appointed the CEO of Women's Health Victoria in 1995. Now in those years, the Kennett years through 92 to 99, are extremely difficult times in Victoria for the women's health sector. There were funding cuts, um, competitive tendering, moving to transfer women's health services into community health centres and services relying very heavily on project funding. And all of this contributed to an undermining of the services capacity to make their own decisions about women's health priority areas for action. And it also meant to focus on local advocacy to survive. It was also in 1996 with the election of the Howard Federal Government and the then Women's Health, National Women's Health Policy and Program which had been established in 1989 began to stall. And with the passing of the 1996 legislation giving the Federal Health Minister the right to veto any application to allow medication, the medication abortion drug RU486 to be used in Australia, 
there was very little women's health se sector reaction. Then in 2003, the then Federal Health Minister, Tony Abbott, signalled his intention to remove abortion from the Medicare benefit schedule. The Medicare rebate for the cost of privately provided surgical termination of pregnancy had been available to women since Medibank, now Medicare, it commenced in 1975. And this alarmed me. What would this mean for women's health? How many steps back must we take? Then I got a phone call from Joan Kerner. She was alarmed. When Joan rings, <laughs> you do meet with her. <laughs> now at the time in Victoria with the Brax Labor government, that's 99 to 2007, <coughs> sexual reproductive health was not an allowable priority for the funded women's health programs. Um, years of advocacy effort to develop a state government policy on sexual reproductive health had failed. It always ended up being about sexually transmitted infection and HIV. If there was any gender lens at all applied, women's maternity services, cervical and breast screening would be thrown in. I remember being told at the time where I was expressing my frustration in the department that anything else is difficult because the Department of Health structure inhibits it regarding the need to carry forward responsibility for a broader sexual reproductive health policy. Efforts to get a state women's health plan with sexual reproductive health as an integral part had also failed. So in response to Minister Abbott's 2003 pronouncement about abortion, a small group of women in Victoria gathered. Now I was one of those. We discussed and agreed the need to set the agenda, not be pushed or surprised into always defending the ground. The first agreement we reached amongst ourselves was to campaign to get abortion removed from the Victorian Crimes Act. Many people didn't realise it was still in there. We agreed to campaign for this for however long it took. We knew this had to be done in our own time with our own resources, we couldn't afford to put our organisations at risk. We drew together passion, wisdom, campaigning experience and formidable networks. We set about gathering knowledge and speaking with potential key influential people. Now this went on underground for quite a period of time. Many times we were met, met with the response of fear and trepidation. Why would you want to attract the anti-choice attention of such hate and vilification to yourself? Why would you want to do anything to unsettle the status quo? You will end up making the current situation worse. I said, how? <laughs> we had many discussions about the way in which women's needs are silenced by fear. We set about putting in place the things we needed to help us run a campaign to provide a vehicle for this. We set up the Abortion Law Reform Association and with its own constitution, committee of management, address website started to populate that. We recruited members into that association, we raised money, we created communication and advocacy tools, we trained our spokespeople and our advocates. We built the campaign so that the voices of doctors and lawyers were heard in Parliament. Women were galvanised to make their personal stories heard in the mainstream media and at their local electorates. And we ensured we were one of many voices calling for reform. We didn't at any point in time attempt to bring all of those voices that wanted reform together to build a message. We let everyone do their own thing. We were focused on getting abortion out of the Crimes Act. We worked across political parties and that was our first absolute deliberate um, part of the strategy and made adjustments to the campaign as state elections came and went and changes to Premier and Health Minister happened. When the bill came before the Parliament, being present, listening to the debate, being on hand to provide background information, witnessing a healthy democratic process of members of Parliament speaking for and against, and then exercising a conscience vote was a great thing. It was an extraordinary thing to be part of a healthy democracy where women's voices could be heard in that way. 
After five years campaigning, removal of abortion from the Victorian Crimes Act was achieved and the Abortion Law Reform Act was passed in October 2008. It brought the law into line with existing clinical practice and community attitudes. It removed abortion from the 1958 Crimes Act. It outlined the grounds on which abortion might take place, may take place up to 24 weeks gestation and beyond. And it stated the obligations of registered health practitioners with a conscientious objection to abortion. This did not, in and of itself, change the difficult circumstances surrounding access to surgical termination of services. What it did change was the way that having abortion in the criminal law materially affected the practice of doctors and their willingness to take part in abortion provision. It also brought to light the way that medical education had sidelined the importance of sexual and reproductive health in medical curriculum. And women's reproductive rights advocacy continued. In February 2006, the RU486 private members bill was passed. This removed the veto, giving the appropriate medical and scientific experts at the Therapeutic Goods Administration the power to assess and determine women's access to that drug. And that was the result of federal parliament cross-party group, that is Liberal National Labor, women in parliament, working together. In 2012, the Therapeutic Goods Administration approved a licence to import and distribute Mifepristone to Australia, and the following year it was listed on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. This did not, in and of itself, change the difficult circumstances surrounding access to medical termination <coughs> services. In November 2015, after a cross-party campaign once again, the Victorian Public Health and Wellbeing Amendment Safe Access Zone Bill was passed by Parliament. The bill supports women's reproductive choices by ensuring that all women can access health services that provide abortions without fear, <coughs> intimidation, harassment or obstruction. It also provides for staff who work at places where, abortion are, where, where abortions are provided to have the right to enter and leave their workplace safely without being obstructed, interfered with, hindered or harassed. And in one circumstance you would um, know killed. And women's reproductive rights advocacy continues. Setting the agenda at state and national levels and across many dimensions within these. Many of the same people who have been involved in abortion law reform in Victoria are involved in law reform in other states and territories. There is still much to do. Equity of access to the full range of sexual reproductive health services must be normalised within our health system, both public, private, hospitals and primary care. Fundamental to achieving this is, enab is an enabling policy environment. Here in Victoria, sexual reproductive health was identified as a priority in the 2015-19 Victorian Public Health and Wellbeing Plan, and then in March of this year, the Victorian Women's Sexual and Reproductive Health Key Priorities 2017-2020 was launched. Now, this is a critical document. This states, the strategy is needed because the evidence has shown that despite Victoria having access to legislation to ensure women have the right to exercise reproductive choices, there remain barriers and service gaps that affect women's access to affordable health care, contraception and termination services in Victoria. Women living in regional and rural Victoria are identified as a key population group. In order to achieve sustainable mainstreaming of accessible and affordable abortion services across Victoria, acute and primary health organisations must be involved in implementing this strategy. This will not occur without women's sexual reproductive health advocacy within and outside of these organisations. In order to achieve sustainable mainstreaming of abortion services in our health services, change must also occur in medical and nursing education. Make sexual reproductive health a mandatory component. Teach the meaning of patient-centred care within this 
and teach the use of conscientious objection by health professionals. Talk about later term abortions. Understand and be conversant with the stigma versus the reality. Understand and advocate the terms of the Abortion Law Reform Act 2008 so that it is that which is implemented rather than interpreted by health professionals within what they feel comfortable with. Bring it out into the open. Ensure women take their experience of make their experience of abortion services known, both the good and the bad. Through formal feedback, health complaints processes, including the Health Complaints Commissioner, or public media. Women's reproductive rights must always be a women's health advocacy priority and the work will never be done. There will always be those who use their positions of power to seek to undo what so many people have achieved so far. Continually building on what has been um, achieved requires effort across so many dimensions. And thank you to all of you for the work that you are doing in your sphere of influence, whether it's legislation, policy, funding, education, research, skilled workforce advocacy, um, informed and active consumers, and being involved in continuous quality improvement in your services. So thank you for inviting me to be with you today.